Okay. Well, I want to welcome everybody to um, this. It, this is our ninth monthly webinar for seniors and caregivers. If that gives you an idea of how long this pandemic's been going on and how long we've all been trying to figure out how to communicate and provide um, education and information for people. Um, as you can see, our topic today is promoting brain health in 2021. And, you know, the whole idea that we're trying to recover from 2020, if nothing physically, then mentally anyway. Um, we thank you for joining us. We've had several people, we've had over 60 people register today, so thank you for doing that. I'm Debbie Tall. I'm with Dignity Memorial. We're, the, we're a large funeral home group here in the Metroplex, and I'll be hosting today. And then we have Marty Mascari, who is from the Area Agency on Aging. Marty? Want to wave? And then also Michelle Owen, you might be able to see her name up there. She is um, from the Wellness Center for Older Adults. And both Marty and Michelle are going to be taking care of our technical side today. So we thank them for being here. The other sponsor that we have for this webinar is the City of Plano, um, specifically the Sam Johnson Rec Center. And as we all know, rec centers, senior rec centers are closed right now. So again, we thank them for being a part of the sponsor for this. Um, as we begin, let me cover a few pieces of just housekeeping kinds of stuff. If you experience any kind of technical difficulty during the presentation, um, there's a little chat box over there that you can type that in. And Marty is watching, so he can help you with that. Michelle will be advancing our slides. Uh, so Marty's going to be the one helping with the technical side. The other thing is that Marty attaches this presentation, the slide presentation, to your Zoom, to the Zoom mm -hmm. invitation that you received, so that if you would like to have a copy of the presentation, you'll have it um, available to either review or share later on. And then mm -hmm. lastly, uh, we certainly invite all of your questions for our presenters. Um, we know that sometimes while the presentation is going on, a question will pop up and we ask that you put those in the chat box itself. Um, and then we'll get to those at the end of the presentation because we oftentimes find that the answers to those questions may already be incorporated into the presentation and it kind of allows the, our two presenters today to have as much time as they need to share information with you. So we'll get to those at the end and I'll be tracking those. So as we begin today, let me start by introducing our two presenters. Holly Glover, who is the Director of Education and Family Support for the James L. West Center for Dementia Care. She's located out there in Fort Worth and we see her beautiful sign behind her. And then Ron Nevelo is a Vice President for Inspire Senior Care which is a leading provider of brain fitness programs, and they have offices here in Plano and Dallas. Um, Holly and Ron will be giving us information on what happens to our brains as we begin to age, and then giving us some ideas of things that we might be able to do to keep our brains healthy, which I think is a concern for all of us. So Holly, with that, let me turn it over to you, and thank you both so very much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. So I just wanted to start by saying, as we're looking here at the older healthy brain, and we are all concerned about aging, but this is something that I hear families say so often that we have got to um, get away from actually. Whenever people come into the West Center and we're talking about the, uh, the disease that their loved one has, so many times they will say something along the lines of, well, they're just getting older and that's why this happened. Developing dementia is not a normal part of aging. Uh, memory loss is not a normal part of aging. So I'm so glad that you are having this program today so that we can talk about those things. What is a normal part of aging? What is not a normal part of aging? Um, developing memory issues is not a normal part of aging. Slowing down is a normal part of aging. It taking a minute. The kind of things we had going on before we got started here, that stress related, or it is uh, 
compassion fatigue or pandemic fatigue, which is a real thing that all of us have going on right now, but actual memory loss is not a normal part of aging. So if you look at this slide that we have up right now, and again, you'll, you'll get all of these, the older healthy brain. So some of the things that's happening in that very first bullet point, we slow down, we're going to slow down, but we continue to stay extremely resourceful. As a matter of fact, our comprehension and our general knowledge improves. We continue to learn things. And hopefully, as we talk today uh, with both of us, we're going to show you ways to continue to improve your brain. There are studies that show that if you give tests to a group of college students and you give those same tests to a group of, and these can be memory tests, these can be IQ tests, any kind of test. You give those same tests to a group of people in their 80s they should score the same score, but it's going to take the group in their 80s longer to finish the test. We don't multitask like we used to. We may have to read over it a couple of times, but we are still going to be able to do those things. We're just going to slow down. That blood flow up to our brain may be reduced. We may start seeing some shrinkage and we may have some inflammation. So if we have to have an MRI for any reason and we hear those words, there, there may be reasons that we're having those. We actually, there are some things that actually improve. Being able to perceive other people's emotions, being able to read people, gestures, body language, tone, we actually get better with that. We can adapt to new changes and tasks, even if we don't want to. Whenever we see that there's a new update on this phone, we can do it, even if we don't want to. Uh, that is just a normal part of aging, that we can still learn. New learning can take place. When somebody cannot learn new things, then we're looking more at a dementia. And we'll, we'll talk more about what it looks like whenever it may actually be dementia. But we are gonna have that slower response to sensory sen uh, stimulation. And then we've got that cognitive reserve, the brain's ability to work well, even when some part of it is disrupted. All right, let's go to the next slide. So just some quick brain facts. The normal brain weighs about three pounds. If somebody does develop dementia, uh, at the end of life after dementia, it is about one pound. Those brain cells are actually dying to the point that at autopsy, that brain will be about one pound. Another one on here that I think is really interesting, uh, the brain is our fattest organ, up to 60% of the brain being fat. That's interesting to me. Uh, but we can strengthen and make new neurons throughout our lifespan. And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about is how do we strengthen our brain and how do we make those new, neur new neurons? And we do use 100% of our brain. All right, let's go to the next one. This is my very favorite little cartoon that's on here. You see the dinosaurs, the ark is sailing away and they're going, oh crap, was that today? Uh-oh, causes of memory loss and confusion. So every time that our loved ones or even we have some type of memory loss, we don't need to automatically jump to, oh my goodness, that must be dementia. There are other reasons why we might have some memory loss. And I've already mentioned one of them is stress. And in this past year, in 2020, if you caught yourself being isolated, maybe being alone for too long, not having social interactions, eating a lot of stuff maybe you shouldn't have been eating, drinking more than you should have been, those kind of things, and you caught yourself having some memory issues, those are the reasons why you were having them. But we can start having some memory issues and confusions because of infections. We can have memory loss and confusion because of uncontrolled diabetes or high blood pressure. Sleep apnea is another one. And you look on there, uh, nutritional deficiencies and interaction of medications. That is usually when somebody goes, so the initial place we want to go to the doctor is just our primary care whenever we start seeing maybe some memory issues in someone and have them do a complete blood workup and look at all of their medications, make sure they're taking them properly because so many times it will be an interaction of medications. Of course, lifestyle choices with drugs and alcohol, and this can be prescription drugs. I did a program yesterday on compassion fatigue and burnout on taking care of people with dementia and the numbers right now of alcohol use and abuse of prescription medications has just skyrocketed while people are at home. And then depression and anxiety can also lead to memory loss. I've got an entire slide on depression, some new statistics on that. 
All right, let's go to the next one. Now, there's other causes of memory loss and confusion that actual dementia. And a dementia is progressive and a dementia is terminal. So number one question I get asked all the time, what is the difference in Alzheimer's disease and dementia? So if you think of that umbrella that you can see right there, dementia is an umbrella term used to describe different conditions. So if someone were to say to you, I was just diagnosed with cancer, our first question would be, what kind or what type of cancer? It's the same thing with dementia. My loved one has been diagnosed with dementia. What kind of dementia? Because there's over 130 different types of dementia. These are the ones that we see the most often with the number one type of dementia being Alzheimer's disease. You can find statistics that say anywhere from 60 to 80% of all dementias is Alzheimer's disease. So for someone to say, um, because I've had people say this before, oh, my dad has Alzheimer's, but he doesn't have dementia. Yes, he does. He has the most common type of dementia. But they could also say, my dad has dementia, but he doesn't have Alzheimer's. That could be correct, because he may have vascular dementia and not Alzheimer's. So vascular dementia is the second most common type. It's exactly what it sounds like. It has to do with the cardiovascular system. And that is the one dementia that we know we have some control over. And a lot of that is gonna be exactly what we talk about today. Um, frontotemporal dementia, you may have heard of. Dementia with Lewy bodies, Huntington's disease, they'll develop dementia. There's mixed dementia where they, there's a, like a dual diagnosis where you can have Alzheimer's with vascular alcohol and drug induced dementia. And those are just the most common ones that we see. There's over 130 different types. All right, the next one. So how to define dementia. Uh, if you see there in bold, dementia indicates problems with at least two brain functions, such as memory loss and impaired judgment or language. Two of those dementias that we saw in that earlier slide can actually present with no memory loss. A person who's developing frontotemporal dementia or Lewy body dementia, many times we'll see impaired judgment and language issues before we see memory loss. So people will kind of, when I go and I teach about dementia, one of the first questions I ask is tell me everything you know about dementia. And typically I get three responses. Memory loss, they forget and they can't remember. Those are all three the same thing. But for most people, that's all they know about it. And they have no idea that dementia can present with no memory loss. And those two can. So again, Alzheimer's and related dementias are not a normal part of aging. All right, let's go to the next slide. So these are the things when we're talking about brain health. These are the um, six components that we want to look at. Uh, a plant-based diet, which we'll look at a little closer, exercise, quality sleep, managing stress, staying socially connected, and brain fitness. Brain fitness, I think, is probably the funnest of those, and we'll uh, look at some of those later, but we're just going to take a glance at each of those. All right, let's go to the next one. So our risk factors of developing some type of a dementia, our number one risk factor is age and there's not a whole lot we can do to stop the clock. Uh, we can take care of ourselves, but we cannot stop the aging. Dementia is typically only about 30% genetic. If a person has developed mild cognitive impairment, many times they will go on to develop dementia. And then they have now discovered that people who have Down syndrome, if they live to be over about the age of 50, about 50% 50 of them also will develop dementia. Let's go to the next slide. So what are our risk factors? If it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. So if you see yourself on this list anywhere, we need to make sure that these things are controlled. These risk factors are going to damage our brain and it can happen, it takes a long time, it can be very subtle changes. But if we've got a lot of heavy alcohol use, smokers are at an extremely high risk of developing vascular dementia. Anything that is stopping that blood flow from going up to the brain, 
uh, and then we've got plaque buildup, untreated high blood pressure, high cholesterol. If we've got any type of vitamin deficiencies, we've had any type of a head injury or concussion uh, or traumatic brain injury, depression, and we're going to have a slide specifically on depression. A person who has had chronic stress throughout their life. Now, again, we're not talking about that situational depression or that situational stress that we all go through. Empty nest syndrome, starting a new job, getting a divorce, getting married, you know, <laughs> everything that's also good can also have a lot of stress. Those are called situate, that's situational stress, that's situational depression, that's not chronic. That's not like a major depressive disorder. Uh, being overweight and then diabetes also. All right, the next slide is the one that deals specifically with depression. And I've been looking at this a lot and we're actually gonna be doing a program very soon uh, where we're gonna talk about the difference in depression and dementia and the way that it presents. So depression and anxiety are the most common mood disorders in the United States, but only about a third of people are actually um, getting treatment because people are ashamed of this. And I'm glad that we have so many celebrities and sports figures who are starting to come out now and talk about it and, because it isn't anything to be ashamed of. So, but what's happening whenever we're having a lot of anxiety and anxiety, when we think about depression, anxiety, depression typically is when we're hung up on things of the past, when we're doing a lot of the woulda, coulda, shouldas if I'd have onlys. Anxiety, on the other hand, is when we're looking more toward the futures, what will happen, the what ifs, mites, those type things. And boy, in 2020, we had a lot of both of those going on, but did we have anxiety in 2020? We still have some anxiety going on, lots of what ifs. It changes our chemicals in our brain. And if we continue to live at that level, it's changing those chemicals in our brain and it can change them permanently to the point that we do end up with dementia. Another area damaged by depression is the conflict resolution center of the brain and the prefrontal cortex and that is associated with planning and executive function and that's from anxiety and depression. All right, let's look at the next slide. So one of the first things that we absolutely have control over is our diet. And there has been a diet that has been created by neurologists that is called the MIND diet. It's there in the middle of the screen. It's a combination of the Mediterranean-based diet and the DASH diet. I've also put on there the foods that we want to avoid that we actually know damage the brain. But I want to make sure we get to, let's go to the next slide and look at this MIND diet. So this is fine diet. It's actually pretty easy to follow. It has 15 components, 10 things that we want to make sure we're adding to our diet and five things that we want to either completely eliminate if we can, but we do live in Texas. And so trying to eliminate red meat, butter and cheese, I mean, that's, that's asking too much for, for a lot of us. So if we can't eliminate it, we want to at least be able to cut back on or limit these things. And we can do that. It may take some effort, but we can do it. I want you to notice up there are the brain healthy food groups that you don't just see fruit, but you do see berries. Berries, strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, filled with antioxidants. Other fruits that we love so much, those oranges and bananas and grapes, there's a reason we love them. They've got a lot of fructose in them. They're sweet, it's sugar. So we want to steer more toward the berries. But that is the mind diet. That's it right there. So it has the 10 that you want to try to follow and the five that you want to limit. All right, let's go to the next slide. This one to me is um, upsetting. A research of soda. This was done by the FDA. Those who reported at least one diet drink, this is our diet drinks. This isn't even our sugary drinks. Look at this statistic three times more strokes and three times more likely to develop dementia. That right there, I think, will make you set them down. It has made me set them down. Whenever I first started looking into this and reading about it, soda. All right, let's go to the next slide. 
So the next one is exercise. And this is actually the best thing that we can do for our brain. Being physically active is our brain's best friend. Because if you think about what's going on whenever we are exercising, we are rushing oxygenated blood up to our brain. It strengthens our muscles and our bones. It decreases our risk for falls. Everything about it is good for us. It improves our sleep. It improves our mood. If we can get in the habit of doing it, when I used to work for the Alzheimer's Association and I would help people stay in the home as long as possible. And so many times those caregivers would say, when am I possibly going to exercise? But ask, do you walk to the mailbox? Yes, could you walk to the mailbox twice? Okay, start with that. Get some little arm weights and sit and do it during commercials. I've got a medicine ball that sits by my chair in the living room and in commercials, I sit and I do the medicine ball over my head easy things like that, something to just get moving a little bit more than you are now. All right, let's go to the next slide. Sleep, brain health and sleep. So what's going on whenever we sleep? And there's a quote here that I want you to look at. The restorative function of sleep may be due to the switching of the brain into a state that facilitates the clearance of waste products that accumulate during wakefulness. But when we're asleep, we have a fluid that's washing over our brain washes away that beta amyloid plaque. Beta amyloid plaque is what we now know is happening in the brain of those that have Alzheimer's disease. Relationship between sleep and dementia. We've got to get quality sleep. If you're somebody who has sleep apnea, making sure that you're wearing that CPAP and that you're wearing it regularly and doing the things that you're supposed to do. The other thing that's happening during sleep, I always think of it as the file cabinet, where all of that new information that we took in during the day, we're filing it, we're putting it away where it needs to go. So sometimes when we wake up in the, or we have that, let's sleep on it, we'll talk about it again in the morning, let's, let's sleep on it tonight. It can, if we wake up in the morning, we go, oh, I've got the answer to that problem that we had yesterday, we actually can problem solve with our sleep. All right, let's go to the next one. So stress and brain health. This past year, we've had a lot of stress. Before we came on this program and we were having some technical difficulties, I even made the concept, uh-oh, we're dumping cortisol, because you have that moment of panic, and we do. We dump cortisol and we dump adrenaline. That isn't good for our brains to constantly be living in the state of dumping cortisol and dumping adrenaline that can actually cause inflammation in our brain. There's a link between inflammation and dementia. When we live at that heightened state of awareness, we are walking around living with our blood pressure up, that cortisol up, our heart rate up, our breathing becomes rapid and shallow. We stop doing those belly breaths like we're supposed to do and we start doing chest breathing that can actually uh, lead to digestive system. It shuts down whenever we're under stress. We can develop IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, whenever we're staying under stress all the time. So it has, stress affects everything in our body. Okay, let's go to the next one. So one way that we can de-stress is with meditation. There's other ways to relax here. Deep breathing, we can do anywhere. Doing those four by four breathings where we breathe in for four, we hold it for four, we breathe out for four. Using guided imagery. All of these things, you can look on YouTube and you can, if you type in guided imagery, you can find five and 10 minute videos. And it's where you, or you can actually use Go to a place in your mind where you've been before and you use all of your senses while you're there. Have yourself a music list that you use. Exercises on there, reaching out. I've got a, a star by talk about it. I'm a licensed counselor. And so I'm gonna tell you as a licensed counselor, it is okay to talk to yourself. It is perfectly fine to talk to yourself. Sometimes that's the best thing that we can do. I read an article this week getting ready for my program I did yesterday that said that the number one thing that they use to teach Navy SEALs during their training is positive self-talk. How to talk to themselves. How to talk yourself down from a situation. It said it doesn't matter how strong a person is, if they walk into a situation and they can't reframe that situation, it doesn't matter how physically strong you are, you're a Navy SEAL. You've got to be able to reframe it. So we've got to talk to ourselves. And in my support group yesterday, I was talking to caregivers about 
positive self-talk, affirmations, walking to another room, saying out loud to yourself, I've got this, I can do this, I can do another day, but using that self-talk. Laughing is so important. Take a minute and Google Tim Conway and Carol Burdett and just watch one of those for 10 minutes and you will laugh. Sometimes we just have to take a break during the day and laugh. All right, let's go to the next slide. Staying social. Boy, we've had a problem with that this past year, but look what we've been able to do. We're able to do a program like this and stay social. Uh, I've got people who are telling me that their crochet clubs are now on Zoom. Their book clubs are now on Zoom. Our church is now on Zoom. So we can still see each other or we can meet somewhere and we can sit a distance apart. We can have someone maybe sit on the patio. We have to stay social though. There is so much research that shows that if we stay social, we have better physical health and we have lower stress levels and our depression is down. All right, let's, next slide. So let's get to the brain fitness real quick. This is my favorite part of it. So when we're doing brain fitness, it's just like when we're doing fitness for our body. If we're doing fitness for our body and we go to the gym and we take that one barbell in our right hand and every day we're working that arm, we're gonna have a great looking right arm and that's it. So if we're doing the same type of brain fitness every day, if we were to look at that brain, that same area would light up every day, but none of the rest of the brain's lighting up. So we want to do, we wanna make sure we've got three things. We want it to have something new, we wanna have some variety, and we wanna challenge ourselves. So if we are doing the easy crosswords every day because we can and we enjoy being able to fill those in, then we wanna challenge ourselves with the hard crosswords. And we don't have to do the hard crosswords every day, but let's at least do it sometimes so that we can challenge ourselves, have some variety, try a different type of puzzle but make it progressively harder. If you're doing online games, lots of times those will get progressively harder with you. All right, let's go to the next slide. So here's some other ways to do brain fitness. Bridge is a fantastic game for the brain because you have to use memory, visualization, and sequencing, and it's social. So some of you may be going, no, nope, it's too hard. That's exactly what you're looking for, is something that challenges you, something that you think is too hard. If you press yourself, if you push to learn it, that's when you start having brain fitness. Just traveling to different places. Now, if we go back to the same places over and over and over again, that isn't necessarily uh, lighting up those different areas of our brain, but just planning a trip somewhere, pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone is part of brain fitness. So culture is on here also. I'm not a huge fan of modern art, but when I was in New York City, I went to the Guggenheims. I wanted to be able to say that I'd been there and didn't necessarily enjoy it, but it did stretch my, it pushed me out of my comfort zone. Those are the kind of things we want to be doing. Maybe see a play, listen to some music, watch a movie with subtitles, do something along those lines that we wouldn't normally do. Those are great for our brain. Use your non-dominant hand. That's another really easy thing that we can do for our brain. I can now text as fast with my left hand as I can with my right because I started doing this when I started teaching about it. Just using the non-dominant hand. Use your non-dominant hand to brush your teeth in the morning. Use your non-dominant hand to fix your hair. Uh, I had somebody tell me after doing a program that they tried to sweep the other way and how long it took them. That's good. Those are good things for your brain. Using music is fantastic. It's a great stress reducer. We all have a music set. There's a lot of uh, research done on music therapy. Our music set is normally the music we listen to between the ages of 12 and 25. Now for some of us, that's a little bit scary if you, if you were a teenager in the 80s. Uh, so I've got my music set from between the age of 12 and 25. But that's my go-to music. That's my feel-good music. Have a playlist that you listen to on your way to work have a different one that you listen to on your way home as we're getting ready to switch roles and put that different hat on to go home to be the mom and the wife and the daughter. And then we've talked um, some about puzzles. All right, let's go to the next one. So one way to wake up your brain. So we're about halfway through. So if everybody would try this and I can't see you, but I'm gonna do it, but this is an easy way to wake up your brain. If you touch your nose with your right hand and with your left hand, you touch your right ear. 
and then you switch it and you switch it and you switch it and you switch it. That's actually an exercise that helps wake up your brain and it's working both sides of your brain. Some of you may remember when we used to talk about, can you pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time? Well, I can do it because I teach it all the time, but if you try it, it's not that easy to do. And then you switch hands and do it the other way. Those are the kind of things that actually wake up your brain. If you're in the middle of the day, if you're in the middle of a webinar and you just kind of need to, oh, I need, I need a jolt and I'm not gonna grab the caffeine because I'm not gonna have that soda, then you can do something like that. Let's go to the next one. Here's some easy brain games. Doing games like this where you're filling in a blank and I'm gonna say these real fast and I want you to think of the, I want you to answer it to yourself just real fast in your head, see how fast you can answer. A bed of, a drop in the, a bolt from the, a knee jerk, a leopard cannot change its, all that glitters is not, back seat, better late than, Bonnie Ann, that's a brain game. Another thing that you can do, and this is something you can do in the car, is you can do something like a categories, where you take a list, boys' names is easy, and you start down that list and you're starting uh, with the alphabet. And I'm, gonna, I'm sitting here in the car. This is actually, these things are good for your brain. Instead of sitting there fuming over traffic, okay, Alan, Bob, Chris, David, and you just start naming boys' names in alphabetical order. Easy things like that. All right, let's go to the next slide. So in conclusion, healthy brain, whole person wellness is what we're thinking about. That positive self-talk, managing our stress, our diet, our sleep, being a lifelong learner, continue to read, watch shows that not only are entertaining, but that you're learning something from them instead of just uh, sitting and staring at the box on the wall. Uh, do take time to watch those things that are fun and that we laugh at, but also watch things where you learn. Knowing the warning signs, getting to the doctor if you do start to see any changes so that you don't put off any type of a diagnosis. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we want to focus on all areas of well-being. We want to strive for progress, not perfection. You're not going to take all of those areas and say, today I'm changing something in every area. No, you won't. You're setting yourself up for failure. You choose one and you do a little bit at a time. Give yourself some rewards along the way. Develop a routine. Keep in mind it takes 30 days to make or break a habit. It's actually 28. 28 days to make or break a habit. So we have to start and we have to keep with it for that 28 days to make it into a habit. Find things that work for you, that's a novelty to you, that's something new to you that you like to do, and then talk to your doctor if you're having any challenges. All right, and I think our next one is our last screen. There's my, our, our last um, slide. There's my information. If you have any questions at all about um, dementia, this is what we do, is we educate about dementia. We talk with students, we talk with the public, we talk with families, we talk with professionals. We can offer um, CEUs for um, social work and for LPCs right now, and we're working on getting ours for nursing. Um, we can provide respite care and we're long-term care. Our day program is currently closed, uh, but we're hoping to have that open again soon. And then we've got our education department. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over back to Debbie. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ron and I, and I have an apology to make. We brought these presentations in separately. And so Ron, I'm going to let you reinforce what Holly has said <laughs> and uh, kind of go through your presentation. I think this is a great example of how unexpected stress can come in. And I hope we haven't caused you undue dementia, Ron. <laughs> Holly did a great job, and I'm telling you, this is right out of a scene from a comedy sitcom. Holly just covered everything I'm about to cover. It's hysterical. So I'm sitting there texting during this whole thing back and forth with Debbie going, did anyone look at these two presentations? Because uh, apparently no one looked at and compared. They're virtually the same thing. So... Uh, if you got something else to do, yeah, you can go. I, I'm going to give you a much shorter version of what she just told you. She did a great job in much more detail. Hopefully, I'll throw a few other things in. Consider mine kind of a summary of what she just did, and uh, hopefully it can be useful because, you know, the more you hear things, 
the more likely it is to uh, sink in, which we know. So hopefully this will work. So uh, next slide. Ron, as you get ready to go, I'm going to invite everybody to that this may be a really good time to bring in some questions and we'll let Ron kind of field some of the questions. Um, and we'll go from there. How's that? Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Okay, what we know, um, as Holly pointed out, <laughs> while the brain ages, um, it can also change and develop. It's not a steady decline as so many people think or fear I should probably say is probably more likely. Next, please. So the term of what we're talking about is neuroplasticity, if you haven't heard that term. It's the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neuronal connections throughout life, which means that what I'm talking about is that a neuronal connection is one neuron connecting to another neuron. It's this pathway and that's how we communicate anything we know in our brain. So when we're first learning to walk, right? It's because the first time that child takes a step, it's the first time that neuron shot and connected and created a pathway telling us how to walk. And the more that same pathway gets reinforced as we walk more and more, we get to a point where we can't even, we don't even need to think about it. We just walk. It's also why you see in brain injuries when traumatic brain injury happens, if that connection gets cut, that person has to relearn how to walk. It's because that connection's been cut. Well, our ability to continue to make those connections doesn't stop. It can continue as we get older. So we're capable of creating, not only reinforcing connections where we have, but creating new ones. Okay, next. Uh, next one. So what's the current brain research? And that's where I'm going to be focused on, on what the brain research is. And I like to do this presentation because um, a lot of stuff is being put out there on the web. There are a lot of articles being put out there. And it seems like everything is good for the brain and everything can prevent or slow down dementia. And, and I've done a lot of research on this and I've, 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 I've taken courses on this and I'm really clear about what the current research is right now. Um, and it's really exciting if you're from Texas, Texas is really a major hub of brain research right now, particularly in Dallas Fort Worth area. There's a lot of not only interesting research, but interesting application of that research. A lot of interesting programs that are going on. Next one. So current global research shows pretty much I can tell you there are five things that are going to keep your brain healthy and or slow down dementia. And yet you can prevent dementia. That's one of the interesting things also. So if you catch it beforehand and you do these things, you can. So what are the five things? In a nutshell, in no particular order, exercise is uh, uh, probably of the five. If you had experts select only one, this is probably the one that it would be. This is where we talk about um, anything that's good for the heart and lungs, particularly for the heart, is good for the brain also. Uh, probably particularly because exercise increases blood flow to the brain, uh, getting that oxygen over to that. Next one. Um, it doesn't hurt also, of course, that uh, getting in better shape allows for improved movement and for seniors less likely for falls. Um, and so healthier brains um, uh, tends to uh, be equated with people that are falling less also. So that's a good thing too. Um, I'd also tell you that from personal experience, uh, uh, getting in better shape, exercising uh, makes you feel better and um, also allows you to eat some foods that are probably not on the brain food list to uh, keep you from adding on that extra weight. So exercise has really a lot of good benefits. Uh, second thing on my list, of course, is social activities. Now, this is the interesting one. Of the five, this is probably the most controversial one. Uh, the, if you ask the World Health Organization, they're going to say this is promising but not proven. Uh, and the reason why is that because when they do pointed research uh, just on social interaction and trying to find a causal link to um, uh, brain health, they're not finding that yet. On the other hand, when they do a uh, multivaried multivariant uh, research, meaning they're looking at a lot of different things all at once, the groups that are more socially engaged, more socially active, are always the ones with the healthier brains. So based on my personal 
experience with it, I include this on my list of five things, probably also because you're much more engaged um, in using a lot of different parts of your brain, different processes within the brain when you're socially engaged. Next. So what I tell people to do, particularly when they're living in senior living communities, is trying different events um, and doing different things that allows you to meet different people. So if you're always going to the same thing, you'll probably see the same people or, you know, if you're always, so interacting with other people gives you an opportunity to learn more about them, them about you. It's a little more challenging socially um, and a lot more fun. You learn, meet more people. Next one. Next one. So brain healthy food, as Holly pointed out, um, uh, there are some clear foods that are considered uh, good for the brain. Uh, berries, as she said, is the top one. And I'll tell you of those, there's a really clear link that blueberries of the, of, of the berries is clearly the best one. And actually of all the brain health foods, I'd probably say the research shows uh, blueberries is probably the number one of the brain health foods. Um, second category is fish. Uh, salmon, tuna, and other uh, fish, fish rich in uh, omega-3 fatty acids, salmon probably being the safest one. Um, my mom really wanted me to include broccoli on this list, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, they include it too. I don't like broccoli, never could do broccoli. But uh, broccoli um, is uh, definitely on all these lists of the uh, brain health foods. Next one. And then vitamin E rich foods, which includes um, uh, oil-based salad dressing, spinach, seeds, nuts, coconut oil, peanut butter, avocado, whole grains. Actually, what's not on this list, I just uh, realized this morning, I didn't put on here, is um, uh, dark chocolate. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Dark chocolate in limited amounts is actually good for the brain too. I was really hoping it would be milk chocolate because then I would have the healthiest brain in the world, but it's not milk chocolate, it's dark chocolate because the sugar, it gets in the way of the healthy brain. Okay, next slide, please. Fourth on my list is taking care of your health. Now, when you read articles or talk to experts about the different things, this is where they're gonna break it out into a lot of different things. I just kind of encapsulate it into taking care of your health. So as we've said before, Healthy heart leads to a healthier brain, so you're going to want to avoid obesity, which is keeping your weight down. If you're a smoker, of course, everyone's telling you to stop smoking. This is the interesting one. Stop here a minute. In the last few years, actually the last five years, this is where a lot of the research on, on, on physical health has been focused on, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And they're getting a lot of really uh, positive results in finding causal links between high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So keeping those in check is very important. And of course, with diabetes, you need to treat diabetes if you can avoid it in the first place. Okay, next. Uh, sleep, always important. Uh, Holly was talking about that, always very important, particularly if you um, discover that sleep apnea may be an issue, which is the next one. Um, also, I'd tell you, keeping hydrated. Um, I'm not sure if, if Holly said this or not, but it's not, and it's not on here, but keeping hydrated is another part of the health. And then uh, go to the next one, that's okay. And then of course, mental health. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Of course, I'm gonna tell you about taking care of mental health next. And part of that has to do with the uh, links of uh, depression and cognitive decline, which I see in so many people. Um, and, and it's not just depression, it's also anxiety, it's stress. There are other mental health concerns that when someone's in a better place from a mental health perspective, they tend to um, have healthier brains. Next one. So recent studies are showing positive results for brain health with things like meditation, listening to soothing music, anything you're gonna, and you're gonna see a lot of these mentioned. These are all related to lowering stress levels because as you lower stress levels, this is healthier for them. Okay, next. And then challenging yourself cognitively. Now, this is a really interesting one in that, and this is where uh, in my business, we're doing a lot of focus in applying um, what the uh, research is out there. A lot of people are doing cognitive activities and thinking they're doing enough. And what I'll tell you is understand that it is the challenging cognitive activities is what they're talking about. So stuff that you can do that isn't going to challenge you 
the research is showing it's not enough. And in fact, this first one is computer games that challenge your memory processing speed, concentration, and stuff like that. So one of the questions I often get is, if I just do these games like Lumosity and stuff like that, is that going to be sufficient? Is that going to be enough? And I'll tell them that research is actually uh, kind of iffy on that and, and kind of negative toward it in one way. What they're finding is that when you do it alone, and I find this from my experience in working with people, when you do it alone, you tend to not challenge yourself because you want to win the game. So if it's an activity, it's, it's like a game. You know, you want to win. So you don't want to make it too hard. And what the research says is if you have someone running you through it, it's much more effective. And, and it is effective and it's good because they'll challenge you. They will push you to do the things you need to do. Okay, next one. So one of the most common things I also hear is, okay, what should I be doing to challenge myself cognitively? And I always tell people, research I think is really clear. You need to learn something new. That's the most challenging thing you can do. So when I'm telling you that, I'm not saying to just take a class um, or, or attend a lecture or watch a documentary. That's nice, but you can easily forget it and forget it quickly, okay? So what am I talking about? Well, the first thing I would tell seniors to do in learning something new is about technology because they didn't come from a world of technology. It's a whole new world to a lot of them, to most of them, and learning new things that you will then need to maintain that knowledge of and then use that knowledge and keep bringing it up. That's the stuff that's really good for the brain. So technology is a great thing. Um, Sudoku puzzles is my thing. I love that. That's why I put it on that list. But doing Sudoku puzzles isn't the challenging piece. So if you're already good at them, I'm not including that on this list. I'm talking about the person who doesn't do them at all and learning how to do them, or the person who's okay and can find someone to teach them different techniques or tricks that will bring them to a whole nother level. See, that's the stuff they have to recall later, and they have to make some um, processing of the information and um, uh, determine different things on the puzzle to make it all work. Okay, next thing. Interesting. There's actual research out there that shows quilting and knitting is good for the brain, and the next one. And there's research that shows digital photography is good for the brain. The key is not what you're learning, it's that you're learning new things. I'll tell you another really good thing to learn that's not on my list is a language. Like if you went to a program like duolingo.com, uh, it's a free app uh, that you can find on the internet. And it's really interesting, a lot of different games. You can pick virtually any language, they've got it on there and it's free for you uh, to either learn a new language or relearn something that you kind of knew. I, I think that's excellent new learning and it really is going to challenge you in a lot of ways. What I would tell you though that is that what you're trying to get from this process of um, challenging yourself with cognitive activities, you, I would encourage you to make sure it matches what you're trying to do. So for instance, there are a lot of fun activities, even like what Holly was showing you on there, but a lot of them, particularly crossword puzzles, are long-term memory. If, unless you're having major short-term memory problems, you're probably not having long-term memory issues. Long-term memory, you don't need to worry about until your short-term memory is really starting to struggle with it. Most times I tell people you need to focus on the short-term memory and on processing speed um, and uh, on decision-making. Um, those are the things that you need to do. And you need to find activities that fit that. So while crossword puzzles are great for long-term memory and word retention, which is another long-term memory type of thing, that's not a short-term memory type thing. Instead, it's, it's going to be activities where you're given something like um, words uh, to memorize, and there are different ways of learning how to memorize them, and then mixing those words in with a bunch of other words and trying to select your words out of it. And there are different places like um, Happy Neurons is a, uh, uh, a service that you can uh, get. It's a pay service, but um, it's one that I'm familiar with. That's got all different activities, not, but it's not doing any, it's matching activity with what you're trying to work on that's so important. Okay, next. 
And so that's my little quick summary. Uh, hopefully that's useful. Duolingo.com. Thank you, uh, Holly, for putting that out there to everyone. Um, my name is Ron Neville. I work with Inspire Senior Care. We call it Inspire. We're a mental health practice and uh, we're just trying to implement some of this uh, learning and getting it out there to our seniors. And that's my part. Debbie, back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and I wanna tell you that, um, Kel not Kelly, but um, Bunny came back in and said, it's always good to hear that information twice. So thank you, Ron, for being patient with us on this end and uh, going through it. And then Kelly has a question or a question and actually comments that will lead to one from me. Why don't more long-term care facilities focus on a whole food, plant-based diet? Um, she is acknowledging that oftentimes the afternoon activities are based on chips and cakes and cupcakes and processed foods that are kind of unhealthy. So what type of education do you all provide or are you connecting with the long-term care facilities to help get this um, information out? Well, I'll, I'll tell you my take on this. It's like a restaurant, okay? Um, I, I can go to a restaurant that gives me very healthy stuff and is very conscious of it, but the restaurant that's giving much more tasty stuff uh, at a lower price is gonna do a lot more business. So these long-term care facilities uh, while they are doing what they can to take care of their seniors, uh, they're in a business. And uh, food taste is a big deal. And uh, vegetables and healthy food tend to cost more. So they're competing with people that are giving in to much less costly items and tasty ones. And the seniors are eating it up and they're liking it. And if they like it, they're going to stay there. Ali, you got a different take on it? Just a little bit, especially if it is in a community where, like where we are all memory care, so they have dementia. Um, one of the things that we use for pleasure is food. And with dementia, they do start to lose their taste, but the taste that stays is sweet. So many times, uh, and we also know that with dementia, they are going to start to lose weight at some point. Just as the brain deteriorates, they're going to start to lose weight. So using the foods that do have more calories, more carbs, more sugar sometimes. Uh, and if you think about with, um, if all you can taste is sweet, because I have certainly been known to dump a sugar packet into mashed potatoes to get someone to eat, because they're not going to eat it if they can't taste it. And so ours is a little bit different because everybody already, we, we have dementia. But no, absolutely what Ron said is, is right as well. Can I throw something? I'll, I'll throw something in the book. Can you hear me? Well, I kind of can support that based on conversations with seniors. Can, can you, are you able to hear me? Yeah, this is yes. Marty. Yeah, I, I used to manage Tremont um, in Dallas, and, and I can tell you that one of the, um, the biggest challenges in, in a facility is food. It is by far one of the biggest challenges with the residents. And, and I will say that the, um, the healthy food is usually more a concern of, from the children than it is from the from the residents. The residents are, are of, the, of the idea that that a quantity a quality of life at this point is is what I'm concerned about, and and I want um, my quality of life, whether it's the sweets, um, what you know, no matter what it is, they're looking at that end. But but I can tell you, food is quite a challenge. Um, it, I, I used to use the analogy; it's kind of like going to the same. Um, um, cafeteria every day to eat and you know they're, they're trying to to do their best and to keep it fresh and keep it you know keep some uh, different things coming up but I can tell you the residents want the food to taste good and they want um, their sweets absolutely yeah. comfort food yeah. absolutely Debbie I, are you able to hear Debbie I'm not able to hear her 
<laughs> Debbie, I think we're losing you a little bit. Um, let me... Um, Hear me now? Yes, yes. now we're here. Okay, let me move up a little closer. Um, one of the things that I've just been experienced through family is that we have a 94-year-old grandmother who started displaying a tremendous amount of paranoia who had been completely um, cognitive and calm and then literally overnight went into paranoia and they've now diagnosed that as dementia. Is that pretty typical? It would be a, more of a vascular dementia because the other dementias do not just come on overnight. The only one that can happen suddenly is vascular and normally that's due to TIAs, small strokes. Uh, because the other ones, it, it's taking a very long time, uh, years, for that plaque to build up or the different changes to happen in the brain, that vascular dementia. Another time that we'll see people say it just happened overnight is after a surgery. Number one accelerator of the disease, general anesthesia. General anesthesia is so hard on the brain. And so people will come out of a surgery and families will go, they came out of that surgery with dementia. Well, they had it. That didn't cause it. They already had it. And when we educate them more to a lot of the, there's 36 common symptoms to dementia. It isn't just memory loss. And when we then educate them about it, they'll go, oh, yeah, well, they were doing that. They were doing that. We thought it was just getting older. We go, no, that wasn't getting older. That was dementia rearing its head. One of the, one of the things that I just want to I had some technical issues I was working on, so I wasn't able to, to, to really hone in the whole time. But um, one of the issues that we had um, that came up was um, urinary tract infections. Um, the UTIs are a real cause of, of confusion and dementia. And a lot of times, um, it, you know, as soon as they were able to clear that up, that was, um, th they cleared up the confusion and the dementia. So that's one of the big health factors. And I don't know if you brought that up, but I apologize if, if, if I missed that. Uh, Marty, I'd agree with you. Um, uh, UTIs tend to uh, produce symptomology that is uh, very confusing for a lot of people. They start to think it's other things. It's something that you need to be aware of with seniors. Uh, so I'm aware of the time. So I want to leave with one last thing because uh, I want to make sure it's out there. We're talking a lot about dementia. And my concern is always that dementia is at this point in time not curable and it is progressive. It will get worse. I'd really like us to spend more time focusing on how to prevent dementia in the first place. And one of the things I tell seniors in particular, people looking out for seniors is that they wait too long before they get their brain health checked. And by the time they start doing something about it, they usually already have dementia or they're really near to it. The earlier you find what is called a mild cognitive impairment, the easier it is to reverse the effects and get a healthier brain, and you can get back to being a age-appropriate healthy brain. The closer that is to dementia, the harder it is to turn it around and keep it from ever being dementia. In fact, it's very frustrating because insurance companies will pay for brain fitness services to seniors if they have a dementia diagnosis, but they won't if they don't have that diagnosis yet, which means they're going to pay for you to do a program to slow down something that you can't stop, but they won't pay for you to prevent it in the first place. And it drives me crazy. So I've talked to a lot of seniors who are like, nah, I'm fine. I don't need to look into it. I'm fine. And it's like, they're not fine. And they know they're not fine, but they're not far enough along to where they're willing to get checked. And by the time someone says you need to get checked, it's usually really bad. And the denial and the fear is, is the reason for that. I mean, I hear the exact same thing with, or if I'm somewhere, when we used to have health fairs and we'd set up the table, oh, I don't need y'all, I'm good. <laughs> so absolutely, uh, taking care of it before we need to take care of it. Yep. Question that we can ask a doctor that um, will get them to do the initial cognitive testing? Is there something specific we can ask? Say that again, Debbie, I'm not clear on the question. Okay, so when we go to our doctor and ask about 
the testing to find out if we're on the road towards dementia, you know, that early diagnosis that you're talking about, getting ahead of it instead of behind it. Is there something, a question or a, a test that we can ask for specifically um, that, that starts the process versus waiting until it's too late? So what I tell you is I think doctors are typically testing for dementia. And I think, once again, once you got it, you're too far along. I, I, I want to catch it before it's that. I want to catch the mild cognitive impairment. So I think that if you're starting to notice that there are issues with processing speed, for instance, when someone asks you a question or talks to you in a conversation, it takes longer than it used to to think about what you want to say or short-term memory, which is the most obvious one, or decision-making, when you start noticing those things, I'd actually get to a psychologist rather than a medical doctor, because they can do a series of different tests to gauge whether you have a mild cognitive impairment, whether it's dementia, or whether it's age-appropriate, this is normally, this is not unusual, and it's not out of the realm given your age. They're the ones to really talk to uh, and, and, and connect to. Ron, do you all do that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so my company's Inspire. We're a mental health practice operating in senior living communities. And that's one of the big things that I'm always telling people. You've got this in your community. Let us test you. The best news I can always give is you don't need our services. Our testing showed you're age appropriate. And by the way, if a year or two or more from now, you start thinking it's getting worse, let us give. It can be really simple. It doesn't have to be like this whole six hour neuropsych testing. It can be a screening that takes 30 to 45 minutes by psychologists and they can tell you. Okay, um, I've got one other question here from, um, is it R? Uh, Brian, he said, can I get a copy and a CEU on this? Can I get what, I'm sorry? a copy of the presentation, which we know is yes, and yes. it will be up for the recording. You put that in, yes. our, in our email. Yes, um, I will send. Uh, Holly, you mentioned doing CEUs. Can you answer, can, can he get a CEU or can no. they get a CEU from this? Yeah, we, we did not set this up to do CEUs. Um, okay. I, I don't have it set up to do CEUs, but, um, but the recording and the, um, and the um, the slides, um, even though I put the link on in in the chat, and, and, and you should have gotten that with your login information. I once I have the recording up on YouTube, I will send the link out to everybody who's registered and everybody who who, who signed on that I have email addresses for. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I know that we're running out of time, so um, I want to invite you next month. Um, it's on the 18th of February. Ed Sanders is going to be with us. He, he specializes in training seniors on technology and helping them with their, their technology devices. But he also wants to share with us how we are now able to put our medical identification and information on our cell phones because many of the emergency technology or emergency personnel are checking cell phones first versus um, going to your refrigerator to find out what kind of medications and all. So he's going to be talking to us about that next month on the 18th, and we hope you can join us then. He's a good guy, and he's very knowledgeable. Yeah, right. and, works, and works specifically with seniors. Yes. So uh, seniors and caregivers, stay tuned for next month. We look forward to it. Thank you so very much for being here. Holly and Ron, uh, thank you so much for the information you've given us. Ron, thank you for being a good sport. Really <laughs> appreciate you. I said this is stress at its best. Um, <laughs> but we really, really do thank you both for, for giving us your time and your information. And we've got your contact information. If anybody would like to follow up with either one of them, please do. Please. please.